Let's test your knowledge on all things astrophysics or space, starting off with some questions that are good for both GCSE and A-level. Number one, what is the generally accepted theory of how stars form? From a nebula, that is a cloud of gas and dust. Gravity causes particles to be drawn together, they heat up, the temperature rises, and fusion can begin. Then we say a protostar or a baby star is formed. Number two, why do stars become red giants or super red giants if huge when they die? That's because the hydrogen runs out, all of it's been fused, and now the heavier nuclei fuse together, which makes more energy, and they start to expand. Three, what happens to red giants and super red giants when all the fuel runs out? We have a reduced outwards force due to less pressure from fusion. That means that gravity is able to collapse the star. If it's a red giant, it can collapse into a white dwarf and then a black dwarf when it cools. Super red giants, they collapse so fast that they produce a supernova, sort of a shockwave from the implosion. And then we're left with a neutron star or even a black hole at the center. And then the outer bits of the supernova go on to form a nebula. Four, what must be true for an object to move in a circle, e.g. orbits? Force must be perpendicular to velocity at all times. We call that centripetal force, don't we? This causes a change in direction, but not speed. It's accelerating, but not getting faster or slower. Five, what are the differences between geostationary or geosynchronous and low polar orbits? Geostationary, satellite is high above the same position on the equator. That's the only place where you can have something that stays above the Earth at the same place. The period is 24 hours and we use them for TV and communications. Low polar orbit, we have a short period because they are lower and the orbit between the North and the South Poles. We use these for weather, GPS and taking images. Six, why do galaxies appear redshifted? Because galaxies moving away from us have their EM waves that they emit stretched. That means that wavelengths appear longer. Seven, what are the two main pieces of evidence that back up the Big Bang Theory? A level, what graph is relevant to this? So we have redshift first of all, but the important bit is that galaxies further away from us are more redshifted. So that means they're moving faster away from us. This suggested that they all originated from the same place if we reverse time as it were. CMBR, cosmic microwave background radiation. If we look deep into space, we see microwaves emitted from all directions. This suggests that the edge of the universe is still cooling down. That's the edge of the explosion, as if the bang never stopped. Eight, what is a black body? It's a theoretically ideal object that absorbs and emits all wavelengths of EM. Nine, this graph shows how classical physics predicts the energy emitted by a black body should vary with wavelength. What does it look like in reality and what do we call this? Instead of infinitely increasing with shorter wavelength, it actually curves back down when we get to very short wavelengths around UV. So that's why it's called the UV catastrophe. Okay, let's go on to some questions just for A-level. 10, how do you calculate intensity of light from a star from its luminosity? Luminosity is the overall output power from a star and intensity is watts per meter squared. So therefore we take the luminosity and divide by the area of the sphere that we're sitting at the edge of, and that gives us the intensity. 11, how bright does a star of apparent magnitude one compared to stars of apparent magnitude two and six? A star that has an M of 1 is going to be 2.51 times brighter than M equals 2. And that's because the scale is based from 1 to 6, where M1 is 100 times brighter than M6. It's a logarithmic scale. 12. What is 1 AU, astronomical unit, equivalent to? It's the average radius of the Earth's orbit around the Sun. 13. What is 1 parsec equivalent to? is the distance at which one AU subtends an angle of one arc second. It's one three thousand six hundredth of a degree. So that's why they're called parsecs because it's short for parallax seconds. 14, what is the definition of absolute magnitude? 
It's the apparent magnitude a star would have if it was at the arbitrary distance of 10 parsecs. Apparent magnitude, take away absolute magnitude equals five log, the distance in parsecs divided by 10. 15, how do you calculate temperature of a star from the wavelengths it emits? We use Wien's law, that is peak wavelength times the temperature in Kelvin is equal to 0.0029. We can get the peak wavelength from the graph that we just saw. 16, how do you calculate the luminosity of a star from its temperature? This is Stefan's law, L equals sigma a t to the power of four, sigma being Stefan's or the Stefan Boltzmann constant. 17, what stars do you find in these three areas of a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram? The curve is main sequence stars. Two is where you find giants and supergiants. White dwarfs you'll find at the bottom, fairly hot, but not very bright. 18, what is the Schwarzschild radius? It's the distance of the event horizon from the center of a black hole. Closer than this, the escape velocity is greater than the speed of light. 19, what three equations give you the magnitude of redshift Z? is equal to V over C. Don't forget that this is only true if V is a lot less than C. It's also equal to the ratio of how wavelength or frequency have changed compared to what they should be. 20, if you see a line from a spectrum splitting, then recombining every so often, what are you probably looking at? Probably looking at a binary star system. We're looking at it end on, so therefore their velocity relative to us changes as they orbit the common center of gravity. 21, what are the advantages of a reflecting telescope over a refracting telescope? We get no chromatic aberration that we do from refraction. We get no spherical aberration or distortion. We have better resolving power and a brighter image as well. 22, what approximation can we make about an object's width compared to the angle that it subtends when we look at it through a telescope? If we're dealing with radians, we can say that sine theta is basically equal to tan theta, which is actually basically equal to theta itself. Therefore, we can say that theta is equal to the actual width of the object divided by the distance it is from us. 23, what equation do you use to calculate the resolving power of a telescope? It's the Rayleigh equation. Theta in radians is equal to the wavelength observed divided by the diameter d of the telescope. Lastly, 24, how is power collected related to the diameter of a telescope? Power collected is proportional to the area, so therefore it's proportional to the diameter squared. Hope you found that helpful. If you want to check out the mind map I made for space and lenses, then click on the card and it'll take you to the video. Bye for now.